Hey everyone, it's Connor here from Durham Hearing Specialists. I hope you're doing well and welcome back to another video. I'm back with some more cases for you. And this one here is a, a mastoid cavity. We've had a number of requests to look again at mastoid cavities. I've chosen this one because it's quite a nice, neat cavity. So uh, most of the mastoid cavities that we've shown on the channel are really weird looking. You know, you, look, you go inside the ear and you think, what in the world is going on here? It's not doesn't really look like an ear, to be honest. And that's because the cavities that I've shown previously, these patients have had very, very radical mastoidectomies, ra very radical surgery for cholesterol and things like that. So this is quite a small but neat mastoid cavity, and it's gonna give me a chance to answer some of the questions and, and explain a few things. So briefly, if you don't know what a mastoid cavity is, this is the temporal part of your skull, okay? Your skull is divided into various different bones. You know, this is your frontal bone, this is your mandible, uh, you know, your occipital bone, etc. your ethmoid bone in between your eyes. The part of the temporal bo bone that houses the ear structures is called the mastoid bone. And you can actually feel it, this kind of lumpy bit behind your ear. That's the mastoid bone. And surgeons often drill into the mastoid bone for various purposes. If they're doing a cochlear implant, if they're wanting to access the middle ear for something like to, you know, take some of the bones out and put a titanium prosthesis in, that's called an ossicularplasty or a um, stapedectomy with ossicularplasty. Um, or you know what, there's various types of tympanoplasties which confuse me. Um, or they might want to drill the mastoid bone out because it's infected. <clears throat> or in this case, I'm guessing by the look of it, they sometimes drill into the mastoid bone to get rid of a cholesteatoma, which is like a, a sort of growing mass of dead skin which is growing backwards invading the middle ear space and then it can grow backwards into the mastoid cavity. So what you end up with sometimes is, you know, you go into the ear canal and you can sort of see where the ear canal was and there's an eardrum at the end, which is what this patient has. You can't see it yet. But then you have this sort of random enlargement of the ear canal, usually going posteriorly. So towards the back of the head, there's this kind of weird, I guess it looks like a backwards P, so to speak. Um, and in this particular patient, the cavity, surprise, surprise, has filled with debris, <clears throat> which they often do to be, <clears throat> which they often do to be fair. So, and we get a lot of these. So, you know, th this patient, I think, had his operation. Uh, he didn't really know what it was for. It was probably for a cholesteatoma. He had the operation sometime in the 1970s. Now, when he told me that, when I was taking history and he told me that, I thought, oh, great, this is going to be a big, gnarly mastoid cavity, which we like because they're often, they're so weird that they're actually interesting and, and you know, difficult to do. But in this case, it's quite a neat one. So what we're going to do is go in and I'm going to just sort of point out bits of anatomy to you. Um, so I'm going to pause it kind of right here. Okay, so that is the eardrum. I think it's not too difficult to identify because although it does look extremely weird, it is that kind of bluish gray tinge that you would expect from an eardrum. Um, <clears throat> that is, I guess, kind of the attic or epitympanum. But in this particular patient, the scutum or the bit of bone that kind of covers the, the, the attic or covers, I guess, the head of the malleus where it would be, that's gone. That is the kind of what was or is the posterior wall of the ear canal. So that's been left unaffected. Now some people call that the facial ridge because the, there is the facial nerve within that structure. So if you think about um, the cranial nerves that run down the internal auditory meatus, you have you know, the eighth cranial nerve, your cochlear vestibular nerve. <clears throat> as well as your labyrinthine artery, but you also have the facial nerve, which, uh, surprise, surprise, gives, you know, innovation and, and sensation to your face. Interestingly, whenever I talk to doctors about, you know, ear surgery and mastoidectomy and cochlear implant operation, they're actually much, much more concerned about the facial nerve than anything else. They, they are very nervous about damaging the facial nerve. But what happens is that it comes down the internal auditory meatus, kind of loops over the stapes and then comes out 
but it's not like coming out towards the screen. It comes out a little bit and then it, and then it goes down. But that is the facial ridge. And if you ever look at some of the mastoid cavity videos that I've um, uploaded previously, you will see that that is a very identifiable landmark. So if you're ever going into a mastoid case and you think, I don't know what the heck I'm looking at, if you kind of see, you know, towards the left of the entrance, this kind of random sort of hump of tissue, that will almost certainly be the facial ridge. And I guess that's some landmark. And then back there is the mastoid cavity. You can't, I don't know if you can really see it very well, but probably kind of here, that's usually where, you know, if enough has been drilled away, that's where you'll usually see a kind of, um, kind of little hump of smooth bone, and that's usually the lateral semicircular canal. So, this uh, cavity is, is pretty small. It's epithelialized, which means that you don't have sort of random bits where but the bone's exposed. It's all covered with lovely pink, healthy skin, which is what we like to see. And what we're going to do here is just kind of tidy up and see if there's anything weird going on. Spoiler alert, there isn't anything concerning about this mastoid cavity. But I would say that if you're going into one of these cases, you know, this kind of thing that I'm doing here, just kind of being, you know, a bit pernickety, you know, stripping away dead skin and stuff, I don't necessarily think that this is a, a, a bad thing to do. I, I think when you, it comes to a mastoid cavity, particularly if it hasn't been looked at in ages by ENT, uh, then you should always be suspicious. You should always go in and kind of strip away layers of dead skin because <coughs> this is often where you'll find basically bits of exposed bone. So it's not, um, I wouldn't consider this kind of stripping away of dead skin and things like that, pernickety or kind of overcleaning, something like that. I think you should always go for it. Possibly you can see well, I guess you have to use the eye of faith, but kind of like right there, that is possibly where the lateral semicircular canal, canal would be, but kind of, you know, underneath a little bit of bone. But I would note that that portion is where it should be, and it is nice and smooth there. Um, so yeah, right where my suction is hovering, that's kind of where, that's where the facial ridge is, or what some doctors call, what do they call it? The sump. I think, S-U-M-P, they call it the sump. And then the part of the cavity that kind of is more posterior to that and goes down, they call that the slump, which is often where you'll find um, <coughs> like debris and kind of like scummy bits kind of forming and stuff. So wherever possible, uh, ENT surgeons try not to create this kind of big slump because they know that it will fill with scum and stuff. Um, scum's probably the wrong word. Debris, let's go with debris. Okay. Um, tympanic membrane there, I, I don't really think that you can see a malleus at all. You can't even see a handle of a malleus and that you certainly should be able to see the head of the malleus. Okay, so if I should bring up another image, which is kind of similar. So here, in this image, you can see that this patient has also been operated on, probably for cholesteatoma, and the scutum is gone, okay? So the scutum, remember, we have to think that the scutum would be a nice, well, a nice thin piece of bone, kind of where the pars flaccida is and kind of concealing the head of the malleus, okay? So in this patient, you can see that that's been taken away and you can actually see there, that's the head of the malleus. So a lot of people think that that right there, like sort of the, the lateral tip of the handle of the malleus, people often think, oh, that's the head of the malleus. No, the head, the head of the malleus is way bigger and it's concealed behind the scutum, which is Latin for shield, it's like a Roman shield, a scutum. So if we look back at our patient, we can see that there's, even though the scutum's gone, you can't see the head of the malleus at all. So I'd rather suspect that the ossicles, or at the very least the malleus has been taken out. Uh, or it was probably you know, eaten away by the cholesteatoma and the surgeon had no choice but to remove what was left of it. Um, Incus, I don't know, probably taken out as well. I have no idea. So I'm just kind of getting up all this dead skin here. And again, you know, under these flaps of skin is where you would typically find random bits of dead bone. I mean, I'm not expecting to find anything because, you know, you can clearly see that the tissue around the area where my sucker is, it's not 
pillowy, swollen, it's kind of lovely and vascular and pink, so that looks good. But again, I am just kind of uh, always suspicious. I don't know when this chap last saw ENT, but it, basically he couldn't remember when he last saw a doctor. He kind of alluded to the fact that it was years and years and years ago, um, and it's never really been looked at. So again, alarm bell should be ringing, and you should be kind of looking all over the cavity. Now I would say that this is probably a good case for using an endoscope. So I am biased because I like endoscopes and I also train people to use endoscopes. But this would be very, <coughs> it would be very difficult for me to look posteriorly into the cavity like I'm doing here. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm basically getting it right in there and I'm forcing the rod of the endoscope to look posteriorly so I can check that all of the cavity is nice and clean and of course it's all epithelialized and lovely. And that's going to be very difficult to use with a microscope. Or loops, probably less of a good idea to go into a mastoid case with loops. Um, but certainly with a, a, a microscope you can do it. But it's just way more difficult because then you'll have to kind of wrench the speculum round and move the patient's head and it's a little awkward. Debris there, that's the Cawthorn hook, Crocs, and overall I thought that was a very successful procedure. Um, nothing gnarly about that mastoid cavity, but hopefully it sort of allowed you to visualize that even though it's highly abnormal, if you know the certain landmarks that you want to look for, then it suddenly becomes a bit less sketchy or scary. So as long as you can vaguely see some, you know, blue-gray tissue of what's left of the, ear, of the eardrum, and of course you know to look for that facial ridge or sump, then of course you'll vaguely know where you are and then you can expect the slump or the main, main part of the cavity posteriorly on the other side. There we go. Hope you found that video interesting. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments section below and I will try my very best to get back to you. And of course, I will see you guys on the next video.